here on the East Coast on uh, Friday, I believe it's January 8th. And I wanted to talk for a few moments this morning about the term white privilege and why that term is wholly inadequate to describe the situation and the experiences of white people here in the United States of America. Uh, before I begin speaking this morning, I wanted to do as I always do, which is to acknowledge the land that I'm on and the indigenous stewards of these lands. So I moved to Washington, D.C. from the Navajo Nation about five and a half years ago with my family. Um, I am a dual citizen of the United States and the Navajo Nation. And the land where I live now, Washington, D.C., is the traditional land of the Piscataway. And I want to acknowledge the Piscataway as the indigenous host of these lands. And I want to thank them for their stewardship of these lands. Um, I'm not gonna talk real long this morning, but I wanted to, I, I've been processing through what's been going on in our nation in the past few days. And as you've seen, I've been doing live streams almost every day. I did one on Wednesday, the day that the, the Capitol building was attacked. And then I did one yesterday and I'm doing one again today, but there's a lot we need to process through. And one of the things that was really striking for me, um, even just in the past uh, few hours, is I've been reading and watching the news about the response of white Americans, because the, the attack on the Capitol was largely white Americans. Um, and almost all of them were supporters of President Trump. And uh, there's actually a, a bit of shock that I saw. Let me just turn off the volume on my phone here a second. There's, I see a lot of shock in the responses of these people. I read one um, uh, series of tweets and articles this morning about the CEO of a PR firm in Chicago who had flown down to Washington, D.C., and he was a part of um, the protests, he heard President Trump speak and marched with the group over to the Capitol building and was one of the people who entered in the Capitol building. And uh, there's been numerous accounts of other people very similar to this man um, who have been fired by their companies as their companies have identified who they are. Some of them were, were, were wearing uh, clothing and, and uh, signed with their company's logo on it or clothing with their their company's logo on it, but many people have been fired because of their participation in this. And while not many were arrested at the actual event, uh, the FBI and law enforcement is going back and through film and identifying them, beginning to uh, make a lot more arrests. And uh, the, the CEO of the PR firm in Chicago actually was arrested and now he's home and his company stated that they were placing him on leave. And an interview he did with a local uh, news station uh, stated that he was ashamed and embarrassed. This was the worst decision of his life and he was in the wrong place at the wrong time and he called it a protest. And as you listen, especially to people who support President Trump, as you listen to the people who were at this terrorist attack, this act of terrorism that um, sieged the, white, the, the Capitol building and disrupted the work of our Congress who were in the process of trying to certify uh, Joe Biden's victory in the 2020 election. And many of them uh, are referring to this as protests and their family members who some of them are being interviewed, even some of the people who, who were, were killed in this um, act of terrorism, um, their families are saying they were good people, they were um, supporters of Trump, but they were not violent. And there seems to be this almost shock or disbelief, which is how can white Americans, how can white Americans be committing acts of terror that is being identified on the global stage as an act of terror? And I think part of this is rooted in, uh, there's so many layers to why this is happening, but part of this is rooted in the fact that we refer to what white people have in this country is we call it white privilege. And white privilege, as I, especially as I have done research on the doctrine of discovery, I looked at implicit and explicit racial bias. I've looked at um, the, the white supremacist uh, foundations we have in our Declaration of Independence, our Constitution, our Supreme Court. And I came to the conclusion that white privilege is an absolutely inadequate term because it makes it sound like what white people in our country have is somehow a blessing 
it's a good thing and they just need to learn how to share it. So if they have access other people don't have because of the color of their skin, they have to learn how to be better stewards of that and share it and, and distribute that. But that's not true. The privileges, the benefits, the, the experiences that white people have in America based on the color of their skin is not a privilege. It's an oppressive system. And it doesn't need to be shared, it needs to be confronted. And so when even our minority and communities of color refer to what we see the experience of white people to be as privilege, it makes it sound like what they have is enviable or we should have that too, or that's, that's a good thing. We just need access to those same things. And that's not true. What white people have is absolutely oppressive. And it is the fruit of our white supremacist, racist and sexist foundations. And it's the benefits come from the fruits of ethnic cleansing, enslavement, and genocide. I was speaking at a conference, this was maybe about two years ago, and we were talking about implicit racial bias. We were talking about, they were using the term white privilege. And I said, I don't use this term white privilege. And I explained what I just said. And I said, when you found a nation, when you, you build a nation on a doctrine of discovery, when you dis claim to have discovered lands that are already inhabited, and then you ethnically cleanse those lands and genocidally remove the people who live there, when you then go off and kidnap and, and, and enslave hundreds of thousands, millions of people from other continents, and you bring them to build up this nation, I said, guess what's gonna happen? You are gonna become unbelievably wealthy. You are be gonna become rich and, and, and have possessions beyond your wildest dreams but in no way, shape, or form is what you have a blessing. And the problem with that is because it's wrapped up in this theological heresy known as the doctrine of discovery, it then says this blessing comes from God. We have a manifest destiny. We have the right, we have the privilege to commit this genocide because God is on our side and he gave us a land covenant. Say, so no, this says nothing about God's blessing. This says nothing about God's God's on blessing what you've been built on. This is what happens. When you ethnically cleanse a continent and you import people and enslave them and have them build that continent up, you will become wealthy. You will have benefits others don't have. It is not a blessing and it does not need to be shared. It needs to be confronted and deconstructed. And so because white America has been living in this world, that is literally at its foundations constructed with racism and white supremacy built into the foundations. So they've, they've been given these privileges. They, they are treated differently by law enforcement. Laws apply to them differently. They have, they have things that other people don't have. And so when white people then go to hear their explicitly racist president speak and tell them they are victims and their vote was stolen when it wasn't, and then incite them to go to the Capitol and demand that this election be overturned. And they go to the Capitol and they find it's not well guarded. There is not a large police force because again, the police were not expecting people of color to be there. Had, there, had they been expecting Black Lives Matter or other people of color to show up, they absolutely would have had a show of force. But because they knew it would be primarily white people, they didn't prepare. They didn't expect them. They thought they were just going to demonstrate about free speech. And so when that mob of people broke through the police line and then began trespassing onto Capitol grounds and then going into the Capitol building, breaking windows and, and literally terrorizing our nation's capital, they were crossing the line between protesting and terrorism. That's what they were doing. And because the nation has been so used and has been constructed to allow white people to do almost whatever the hell they want to do, it was so easy to cross that line. And so now they're home, their adrenaline's stopped flowing, 
They're looking back at what they did. They're seeing how it's playing out on the news. They're hearing the reports and they're reflecting what they did. And they're, oh crap, I committed an act of terror. And they don't have the category to process that. I wasn't a terror, I was just protesting. You might have gone there to protest, but your white privilege, your what I call it white supremacy, allowed you to cross that line between protesting and terrorizing without even the bat of an eye. The Capitol Police nearly practically let you walk onto their grounds. You were interviewed after it was over. This was just again, this this is what happens. And so this is what I think our nation is, one of the things our nation is trying to grapple with. Because of our white supremacist, racist, and sexist foundations, because we have 250 years of laws and legal precedents that center whiteness and tell white people they are exceptional, and these things are rooted in the lie of white supremacy. Because this nation has been built that way, the ability of white people to cross the line between protesting and committing acts of terror is almost seamless. And many of them maybe weren't even aware of what they were doing but they absolutely were committing an act of terror and they absolutely need to be held accountable. And this is what our nation is gonna to have to grapple with. This is what we're gonna to have to grapple with. This is why I continue to immediately call for President Trump to resign. And if he doesn't resign, I, I, I encourage the cabinet that's left and Vice President Pence to immediately impose the 25th Amendment and remove him from office. And then I call for the House of Representatives in the Senate to impeach him and in the trial to sentence him to no longer being able to run for office again in his lifetime. And I encourage law enforcement to find the people who breached our capital boundaries and who committed these acts of terror to arrest them and to try them as domestic terrorists. We need to have accountability for this breakdown. And then we absolutely have to deal with our foundations. We have to remove the racism and the sexism and the white supremacy from our Declaration of Independence, from our Constitution, from our Supreme Court case laws. If we don't do that, we are going to find ourselves continually in this situation over and over and over again. This is a foundational level problem. Yes, it was incited and exacerbated by President Trump. And yes, he must be held accountable. But make no mistake, what happened this week was absolutely due to the fact that we have foundations that center whiteness and tell white people they are exceptional and they are superior over and above everybody else. And until we address it there, we will not be able to fix this problem. We're not going to be able to address this. And so this is, this is what we have to do. And this is why I, I stopped using, it was several years ago, I no longer use the term white privilege. I call it what it is, it's white supremacy. This is not a blessing white people need to learn how to share. I want no part of what white people have. What they have is, racially oppressive and it needs to be confronted, not affirmed. And so as you think about this past week, as you think about what happened, as you wrestle emotionally and psychologically and even physically with what happened and took place in our nation, Please recognize this is a foundational level issue. And as I said in my live stream on, on Wednesday, please do not cope with this by denying this event was what it was. And please do not cope with it by saying this is not who we are and we are still exceptional. 
President Trump coped with this initially and is still coping with this by denying it. Joe Biden is coping with it by telling our nation, this is not who we are. We are still exceptional. Neither one of those methods will, will allow us to solve this problem. This problem exists because we have a racist, sexist, and white supremacist foundation. And until we address it there, we're not going to fix it. This is where we need to invest in creating common memory. We need to invest in, in building a nation where we the people truly means all the people. These are the changes we need to make. I go back to the quote by George Erasmus who said, where common memory is lacking, where people do not share in the same past, there can be no real community. If we want to build a community, we must begin to create common memory. We have to learn how to confront our history. And until we learn to confront it, acknowledge it and deal with it, we will not be able to prevent things like what happened this week from happening again. I'm going to continue to do live streams throughout these next several days as we process, even as a nation, through what happened. Um, I've been, in my personal conversations, I've been encouraging people to recognize what happened was absolutely unprecedented. And it's not something new, but it's bringing to the forefront what we, what our nation has tried so hard to keep hidden. At some point, I don't know if this week or next week, I'm going to talk about what I talk about in my book. I wrote a book around some of this history called Unsettling Truths, the ongoing dehumanizing legacy of the Doctrine of Discovery. And I have two chapters in there on trauma. And I talk in there about a trauma identified by Rachel McNair as a perpetration-induced traumatic stress. And how that I believe and I hypothesize that is afflicting white people. They are being traumatized by what they are standing on, by the traumas that they are perpetrating. And this is why they are in such a state of denial. We'll be talking about, I'll be talking about that more. I'm not sure if it'll be this weekend or over the week. I'm also going to talk about um, in future live streams about um, the response to the church, which right now has been weak, tepid, and what the church needs to do to confront this history. Because make no mistake, what happened on Wednesday was absolutely not only condoned, but rooted in the heresy of Christian empire and in, in the, the theologies of Christendom, white evangelicalism. And we have to confront it there. So these are serious events and serious conversations over our second cups of coffee, but they're things we absolutely need to learn how to engage with and talk about. I encourage you to reach out to me on social media if you have questions or you want to process through some things or share some things or you have things you want me to address. I'm reading all of the comments and, and, and feedback I get on social media, and I'm trying to incorporate this as best I can into these dialogues, but uh, there's a lot we need to process as a nation. And I absolutely believe that if we can acknowledge our past, deal with who we are, and make a decision we want to become something different, we can change the course of our country. But if we just deny it or live in the bubble telling ourselves we're exceptional, we're never going to get to the heart of the matter. We're never going to fix it. I can't have my relatives walk in beauty, and may we learn how to walk in beauty together. Huck, go on that.